Welcome back to the States, Scott. Uh, we owe a huge thanks to NVS and both waterways as well. Yes, tip of the cap. Naked Vikings, Fins, NVS, and Waterways. What a great trip. What a fun, fun-filled, met all of my limited expectations. Yeah, totally. And um, very little work on our part, to be honest. Um, I kind of organized email inquiries that would come in from listeners, but then directed those to Waterways. And what Waterways did was organize 20 people from all over. I mean, there was people from New York, Brooklyn, um, the San Juan Islands off the coast of Seattle, Maui, um, California, obviously. Flights from all over and then probably 50 different surfboards. So we had three different transport vehicles and arriving kind of at different times within a 24-hour period. But they got us all to a resort that was three meals a day from an epic restaurant perched on a hill so we could see the waves at any given moment from either our room or the restaurant and just kind of pick the eyes out of it. There was every level of kind of um, surf, you know, there's just the easy beach break out front and then the point breaks a little bit more advanced, but it was head high the entire week. And the drivers were doubling kind of as surf guides for us as well. So they would take us to other local spots nearby that were completely empty. And this was all part of the service that Waterways provides. You know, like if we tried to book this on our own, we just would not have had the same experience and we would have been stressed out the entire time. Yeah, no, exactly. And um, like I said earlier, tip of the cap to waterways. What a, you know, I've said this before, when you travel, uh, it's best to go with the best. You don't want to cut corners when it comes to international travel. And I never do. And uh, waterways really took care of us. The relationships is what they foster at their locations. And so having, you know, Connie, let's say on site was just a real help. And then on the waterways side, Connie was part of the resort, but then on the waterways side, if we had flights that needed to be changed or whatever, they can handle that for us. And then they always, you know, reach out to Connie and communicate all of the details as well. So the drivers that I mentioned, one of them has a family property nearby with a surf spot on it. And so you know, he was assessing the conditions on any given day. And he goes, you know, my property actually is probably going to be best today. So he took just a uh, six people or so within our group over to that spot. And so that's just stuff that, again, you don't get if you're trying to do it on your own. And it's also stuff that you probably want to get on year one or year two of going to a place like that. But Waterways has been, you know, fostering these relationships for a decade at this spot, but decades more at other spots. So huge thanks, big success waterwaystravel.com. And then I said NVS fins. Not only do they supply us with fins, but they sent down a batch of fins for the rest of our listeners to use and swap out and sample, and then told me to leave the fins at the resort for the surf guides and for future guests as well. Yeah. And uh, Leif and Jamin, they got me an emergency set uh, for my new twins or two. Like they they rushed me what I needed right away. I mean, they're so customer service oriented. It's just, it's just refreshing, you know, especially when you consider how long it can sometimes take for a custom surfboard to get to your doorstep. Um, those guys with the fin department, they're on top of it. And I really appreciate that. Me too. And the, the quality of the fins are excellent. So surfnvs.com is their website. Naked Viking is their Instagram handle. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just can't. It's you and I get access to and privilege to some of this stuff because obviously we're in media talking about it all the time. But the reality is our listeners have the exact same privilege and access um, because they are that customer service oriented. So just wanted to give a huge thanks to those of uh, those that supported us and our listeners this past week in El Salvador. So, yeah, good, good call. Thank you very much. As we see. Some movement at the takeoff zone. It's Kelly Slater grabbing rail. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy, David. Holy mackerel. Uh, we've got a week, David, of uh, massive surf news in front of us that we need to get to. But before we do that, let me say that um, you're listening to Spit. It's the Spit Podcast. And David Scales and Scott Bass talk all things surf. It's Thursday, April 18th, David. Oh, my, how the time flies. Good morning to you, dear citizen. Good morning, Scott. Welcome back to California. How was your return travel from El Salvador? 
uh, effortless. I had a great, easy um, time coming home. How about you? Also pretty effortless. Um, I took your recommendation and upgraded on Avianca. Um, upgrade. So those seats were pretty tight in the yeah. stewardage class, but the upgrade, there's only like, there's no business class. There's no first class. It's just upgrade. And it's slightly bigger than the back of the plane. <laughs> um, it, I think it included the surfboard or an extra bag or something because I spent the hundred bucks for the upgrade and then they did not charge me $120 for the surfboard. Yeah. I had the same experience. That's a good point. But so it's worth it. It's totally yeah. a break even and you get a better seat basically. Yeah, for sure. Parents. So. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, gosh, where do we start? I guess the lead, let's not bury it. Um, although, well, I'll just say this, Kelly Slater retires and it's all over the internet. It's all over the world. Everyone's talking about it. And, um, so I'm, I'm, you know, a little reluctant, I guess I should say to get, give it too much energy, but it's probably the most important thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Your on thoughts a podcast? On on a surf podcast where we talk about surf news, you're reluctant to talk about Kelly Slater, the greatest no, of all times career. No, I'm not reluctant to talk about it. What I'm saying is, I guess I'm reluctant to talk about the obvious, like the obvious, you know, the eight time pipe masters, 11 time world champ, three time triple crown surfing is both youngest and oldest surfing champion. I think some of those things have just been, you know, beaten to death. Like he's the goat. There's no doubt. Let's presume there's like some COVID listeners. I mean, the way that I think about our show sometimes, Scott, is that listeners don't have magazines that they're getting all their information from daily and they get probably most of their news through Instagram. And it comes through in just these morsels and it's hard to create a lattice of information for them to understand what's what. And so you and I may have the responsibility of creating the context for listeners to fully appreciate what it means that Kelly Slater is retiring. And so I don't think you can overstate it. In fact, I mean, yeah, you know, that's a great paradigm to, to live by, to podcast by the paradigm, the paradigm that we're responsible for creating a lattice, which is an incredible word that you use. <laughs> and I agree with you. Let's, let's not assume, let's just present. You know, what's funny. I actually thought about your version yesterday in preparation. And then I realized these shows live on forever. And if somebody comes back and listens to this in the future, it's important to kind of create the context. Like yeah. this week, if we just kind of breeze past what his accolades were throughout his career, it's no big deal because you're right. Most people notice, but in the future, when people come back and listen, they want a full package. They want the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story. So ultimately, it's important to note he lost in the round of 32 at Margaret's and didn't make the cut, the mid-year cut. So that was kind of the final straw of why he is no longer competing professionally full-time on the tour. Um, do you want to hear, should I play for the listeners, his post-heat interview after losing? Did yeah. you hear his emotion and his thoughts? Yeah. I think that would be kind of helpful. Because I think, again, he's the emotion of it was uh, kind of what we love about Kelly. So here we go. Uh, just it's just so much emotion for so long, you know, so much dedication, and it, you know, it's not all it's not all uh, roses, you know, um, but it's it's been the best times of my life, and and uh, you know, I know my family's at home watching, and love you guys. Um, couldn't couldn't quite pull a miracle off this week, but. You know, I pulled a few off over the years, and uh, I still had that hope out there, you know. I was like, oh, one might pop up with a minute to go. So, um, uh, But to lose to the number one, you know, Griff's the number one guy, and I've, I've been close friends with Griff for a long time. Um, so I'm kind of avoiding that emotion because it's just, it's all right there bubbling up. But it hit me, it hit me at sunset this year because um, I knew that, without a good result at Pipeline. And obviously I didn't do well at Sunset. And, uh, you know, I have been struggling since since my surgery, since the recovery. Um, it's like I'm just fighting through the pain, hoping for adrenaline. But I, I felt at Sunset after that, I was at the house talking to Kalani and I just kind of broke down. I went, you know, I can, it, this, this feels like the end, you know? 
and um, uh, but the start of something else, you know, the start of the rest of life. And you know, I'm I, I've I've had such incredible luck and good fortune over the years, and I think that's what um, it's so tied in with my surfing. So yeah, I'll just have a little quiet time after I spend some time with the crowd and and uh, just absorb the whole thing, you know. But it's been fun to be over 50, still mixing up with the guys and, and um, you know, feeling like I'm there with them and, and um, getting to see these new crop of guys. You know, Rio said to me, he said, don't retire, we gotta get a heat first. And we got it, we ended up getting a heat at Pipeline and, and then Cole and I got a heat, which was fun. And, and um, you know, as I finished with Griffin as a full-time competitor, that's cool. But uh, I, I do feel like if I get a wild card or two, I could end up against Griffin again. So, you know, I'll pay him back. <laughs> Classic Kelly, never letting go. But um, ultimately, he did state, the only statement I saw after that was that he's not going to be surfing in the Olympics. I mean, obviously, he's not qualified for the Olympics, but I think he's finally acquiesced that he will not be surfing in the Olympics. But that was the most of a retirement speech that we've gotten from him thus far. He's been on social media the last few days, has not stated an official retirement, all of his friends and loved ones have been posting tributes to him, kind of acknowledging that this will, that signified the end of his full-time competitive career. But we haven't heard an official retirement statement from Kelly other than what we just listened so to. What you're suggesting is that Kelly's going to go on to the Challenger series and re-qualify. It wouldn't surprise okay. me. I am not suggesting that, but look, Kelly... Kelly has not quit professional surfing. He got beat out of professional surfing, but he, um, he's not, he even just said like, look, when I get wild cards, I'll be surfing against Griff trying to get him back for this loss. So. Yeah. I think that's important what you stated. And it's really kind of the thing that sticks out in my notes is that this was a forced retirement. If it was up to Kelly, he'd still be surfing on tour, which made me think, you know, there's that scene where he walks up and, and Kalani and he embrace his his partner and they kiss. And I thought to myself, I'm sure she was hoping that he did not advance out of that heat. I'm sure secretly deep down, she's like, please don't advance. Please don't get a wave. Please don't advance. Now, I'm just, you know, that's just me making it up. But on some level, she had to be going good, you know, thank, thank God it's over. But it's um, partially, it's honestly partially, I think what, attracts us to him so much is that inter or the inner uh turmoil you know that inner like um he should just quit he should just move on with his life but he cannot quit i cannot quit you you know what i mean like he just can't give up he is so dedicated and it part of me is like resents that about him like i've started saying to you four five years ago at least i was like dude Kelly, like he's not winning heats anymore. He can't go toe to toe with Felipe in, you know, whatever way it's snapper, let's say at the time, I think it was. Um, and that's all been proven to be true. He's had a couple of really spectacular highlight moments, pipe naming, namely two years ago when he won that event. Um, you know, so those are great that he stuck around for, but they're so few and far between at this point. And again, within the last five years that it's like, dude, uh, it would be a more dignified exit to leave kind of on your own terms on top, but that's not the way that it all played out. And part of me wishes that he would have preserved his legacy. But the other part of me is like, God, I love the fact that he just will not quit. He will not accept defeat. That's yeah. also very endearing. And the reason why, by the way, he has 11 world titles and 56 wins, you know? Yeah. No, you're right. It's it's gotten to a point where we wouldn't expect it any other way. We'd all probably at this point be disappointed if prior to the season started, he goes, ah, I'm just, even though I'm qualified, I'm going to give it up. We'd be like, right, that doesn't seem in character at all. So, yeah, I mean, you always with like, let's say a boxer who gets kind of, you know, past their prime, you always want to measure them up to a boxer of the new era, you know, or basketball. Like what if, what if Kobe and Michael and Jordan would have, been against each other who would have been the better baller you know what i mean so there we got to see that with kelly we got to see how he surfed against um jordan Martin. competed against kobe and pretty pretty much positive he schooled the living shit out of kobe yeah well now, maybe the wrong example lebron there right? might there's going to be some 
Kobe lovers on here that are probably going to correct me because I'm sure there's some some highlights out there where Kobe, you know, crosses up Jordan and takes him to the hoop. But I know I've seen stuff of of Jordan schooling Kobe. Well, but anyway, um, that's but we got to see we got to see Kelly against Barton Lynch. We got to see Kelly against Sonny Garcia. We got to see Kelly then against Andy Irons. We then got to see Kelly against Felipe Toledo. You know what I mean? Like we got to see yeah. a lot. Mick Fanning, of course, along the way. Yeah. And um, so we, you know, he delivered on everybody's expect beyond everybody's expectations. Like he said, retired at the age of 52. So that's spectacular. His first photo in a magazine was at age 10, which is crazy. First contest win was age 12. First pro event win was the body glove surf bout at Trestles in 1990. At the age of 18, he signed his contract with Quicksilver on the beach famously after that. Um, there's been obviously a barrage of social media uh, posts, tributes to Kelly Slater with excellent photos and just kind of videos and recaps of people's experiences with Kelly over the years. I'm going to read one from his mentor and shaper as a youth, Matt Keckley. Matt Keckley says, quote, what a barrage of emotion and visual imagery the world is showing today. To see a young kid from your hometown set out on a career path and not only exceed, but smash every record, to exceed way past anything anyone ever could have imagined, to lift the art of surfing and propel it as a sport while clinching 11 world titles and breaking every re record along the way, to be influential and innovative in board designs and introduce new wave pool technologies, to invent new maneuvers and thousands of clutch moments in surfing, to raise our consciousness in our natural environment and our surroundings, to influence what we wear and how long we can lead at the highest level. Moving on to a new chapter will free up your mind and space and lift your spirit to new realms of further creativity. Congratulations and thank you for four decades of excellence and friendship and fun times. We hold a glass high to your new chapter. Long live the goat, the greatest to ever step on a surfboard. Yeah, that's cool. And there's, there's, there's been some great stuff and Matt's, Matt's lived been there right by his side the whole way. Um, let me, I'll read you something that I think is interesting because it's from Derek Hind and his ASP top 44 review that he did with surfer magazine. And he I did this I love yeah. this. Yeah, and he did this back so in 93, and I'm going to be quoting Derek Hind here. Kelly Slater will win several world championships in an era when the names Curran, Potter, Hardman, Elkerton, and even Garcia will fade. He is the beginning. No end is in sight. He can't lose. Should he die tomorrow, he'll be Jimmy Dean. Should he go on... With the job of life, he'll likely go beyond Curran. 20 years down the track, he could be president. He is world champion because he is the system. He's changing the way surfers see themselves. He's changing the way judges see surfers. But he must do justice to the surfer image. He cannot do so in Hollywood because he is real he must do real things. End quote. Derek Hind, Surfer Magazine, June of 93. Pretty good Wild. stuff. Pretty epic stuff. Um, man, we love Derek Hind anytime he makes an appearance. Um, it's a lot of writers like to say things like that about people because it makes for a good story. Rarely do the people that they're ever speaking about deliver on the goods. And Kelly very easily could have become a tragic tale of super supreme talent, the weight of the world being put on their shoulders and then crumbling under that weight. And so I think it does need to be acknowledged that Kelly Slater only ever rose to the occasion and then set a new bar for expectation along the way. And didn't crumble under all of the vice that is available to somebody in his position. That is a huge, huge thing. Yeah, I totally agree. And, um, you know, in spite of, or not in spite of, but to add on to all of his competitive accolades, um, you know, in my opinion, he, he's, 
his greatest attribute, perhaps not his greatest competitive thing that he did, that he achieved, not his greatest achievement, I guess, but his greatest attribute is his openness and his vulnerability towards us, the fans. If you look at all the other goats, David, you look at Tiger Woods, you look at Michael Jordan, you look at um, Tom Brady, they're very controlled in their public discourse. Their management teams are like, okay, stand in front of the podium. This is what you're going to say. And their public front is controlled, right? Kelly's the most candid of the goats. And by the way, he's in that category, Woods, Jordan, Brady, Slater. Uh, Kelly himself, by the way, put Lance Armstrong in that group. But Kelly's the most candid. He's secure and he's emotionally secure. And I would suggest to you that the ayahuasca is working, my friend. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, as we reflect on the career, yeah, those are among the things that are the most admirable to me. Uh, and also probably the reasons he's been able to have a career that lasted as long as it has, rather than burning out as some of the other people have. Um, I think it's also a testament to surfing kind of being the fountain of youth, you know, like footballers can't have that long of a career because it's so hard on your body. So that is, um, reminds me why I love surfing so much, you know, is the more you commit to it, the more you kind of, uh, benefit, I guess, from it holistically, certainly kind of health physically health wise, but, um, mentally, spiritually, it's all very good for you. And it seems like Kelly's commitment to that. He's been a beneficiary of it as well. By the way, my, um, my musty moment presented by trees wax is actually the read you it's so well done. Paul Evans for stab wrote something. The King is dead. Long live the goat. And it's a wonderful breakdown of Kelly's entire career and the ups and the downs. And um, I just think it's just a really good piece of surf journalism that Paul Evans, I don't know who Paul Evans is, but he did a great job. Paul and Evans has been a writer, mainly a lot of Australian magazines for a long time. And he actually wrote that piece a long time ago. Oh, and, did he? Um, he oh. did. Yeah. And that's why it was ready to go, you know, right when Kelly yeah. didn't make the cut. Um he wrote it, researched it years and years ago. And I think it just was when the magazines were kind of going away for whatever reason, it never saw the light of day or the light of print. Uh -huh. And um, and then, of course, modified it to incorporate some of the newer accomplishments of Kelly. Right. But yeah, it's incredibly well done, well researched. And Paul yeah. was there for a lot of those experiences along the way on tour. Yeah. So really well done. It's super good. You, that's a, the must read moment. And I'll tell you one of the lines I'll just pull from, from Paul is, and I'm quoting Paul here. He said, it's not just that everybody in the world knows about Kelly Slater. It's that everybody knows surfing because of Kelly Slater. And that's the Lance Armstrongs of the world. That's the entire non-endemic space that if anyone knows about surfing, um, that's a non-surfer, it's because of Kelly Slater. Yeah. Well, I'll say this too. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, the best thing that can happen for us, David, for fans um, of the World Surf League, of competitive professional surfing, is for them to allow Kelly Slater to commentate finals day remotely. Not even the whole day. The semis and the finals at each event, if they can remotely bring in Kelly as the commentator, pay Kelly whatever it costs to remotely be the commentator alongside the play-by-play -play guy, Joe Turpel, whoever, just to be our commentator, just like our John McEnroe. He's the goat in the water, but frankly, he's also the goat in the commentary booth. Again, um, it will allow the WSL to continue to market Slater. It will drive eyes to the WSL on finals day. It allows Slater and Slater brands to leverage Kelly and to be in the space and to be basically he'll kind of own it again. He, it doesn't even matter who wins the event. Kelly will be the winner, mm -hmm. which we all know Kelly loves. Um, you know, he'll kind of take some of the juice away, much like he did with Adriano when he dropped the clip of his surf ranch going crazy right after Adriano's world championship. So anyway, your thoughts on that, wouldn't that be great? What's the, what's, why wouldn't the WSL do that? Why wouldn't the new CEO go, you know what, we're going to pay Kelly. He's just going to have to spend a day, you know, maybe four hours with us every month. 
We're going to pay a max. It's going to be good for Kelly, going to be good for the brand, going to be good for WSL. It's good for everybody. I don't see how this is a lose. Yeah, no, it'd be it'd be a no brainer um, if they can get Kelly to do it. I mean, imagine how sick it would be if he was like on a boat in the Marshall Islands, like toweling off after a session or in between sessions, you know, and just like checking waves over his shoulder and then looking at the computer screen and chiming in on what's happening. Like that would be incredible. Like getting a little sneak uh, sneak peek into Kelly's life and what he's doing off tour, but he's still fully engaged, of course, in competitive surfing because it was why wouldn't that life. happen, David? I'm I'm angry if this doesn't. I'm already angry if this doesn't happen. Well, why wouldn't I, that happen? There's no cost. There's no amount of dollars. I mean, that's reasonable. Uh, I think pay him. The, the reason why I can imagine it not happening is the WSL is kind of. Uh, the athletes are not the biggest fan of the WSL. And so I could see if Kelly's not on tour anymore, that he wouldn't necessarily want to rearrange his schedule to watch finals day at lowers for the seventh year. You know what I mean? I'm only like, saying the semis and the finals. I'm talking a limited number amount of time here. I'm not saying he's, he's got to spend two weeks on the beach at lowers. No, I'm saying I, I, I need him for four hours. Yeah. I know what you mean. I'm just saying, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, athletes are intentionally distancing themselves from the organization at a certain point. But isn't Kelly already... involved fiscally in the WSL on some level? And isn't it good for his brand? Like, I don't care what athlete you are. I don't care if you're Alex Nost, if they ask you to be involved, even though you're a mid-length cruiser guy, you're going to commentate the finals day. It's just good for your brand to be in front Alex... of millions. No, that's exactly my point is that Alex Nost would never want to be associated with the WSL. Dave right, Parmenter never wanted to be associated with, right, the, you know what I mean? Right. Like, okay, there becomes look, a those are bad examples, but well, Kelly, well, let's no. talk Kelly Slater. You're telling me Kelly Slater wouldn't want to be involved in the thing that he spent four decades doing. I'm saying the thing that he spent four decades doing has really changed paths. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if he, yeah, if he just opts not to, if maybe his ideals for what he wanted it to be and what it's becoming are two different things and that he chose not to participate at a certain level. I find that hard to believe. Maybe you, said right. what's, you said, what's the one reason why he wouldn't do this? And I just gave you the one reason why he wouldn't do it, because otherwise he would do Give it. me two reasons. <laughs> Dude, okay, all I know is he gets to wear his two? outer known hat just like this. For four hours, he's probably yeah. watching it anyway. And it's just good for everyone. And he's getting a paycheck. Look, I was trying hard to play your game of why wouldn't he do this? And that's the <laughs> only thing that I can think of. And along those lines, I mean, the yeah. WSL does have kind of a little bit of a PR uh, thing that they need to address, which is they lost a lot of marquee athletes this year. They lost Stephanie Gilmore, Carissa Moore, Felipe Toledo, and now Kelly Slater is not on tour any longer. Those other ones opted out on their own accord. And Kelly, of course, you know, lost at the mid-year cut. But I think that is still something that... Well, that if, plays into my... That's why you would want Kelly, to keep the marquee name in, in front of everybody. I mean, imagine your press releases that are going out. Yeah. Join us for finals day in two days, and Kelly Slater is going to be commentating. For, you know, I mean... Yeah. Factormeals.com slash surf 50. Let me tell you, Factor Meals has filled a specific gap in our lives that has simplified our busy schedules and satisfied and nourished us. If you follow me on social media, you know that I love to cook. My wife and I love food and wine, but there are still at least five meals a week where we're just underprepared, short on time, and don't want to make a bad dietary decision, nor sacrifice the pleasure that we get out of dining. Factor has solved it. Chef prepared meals that are delivered to your house weekly. They take two minutes to heat up and they're designed to be eaten anywhere. There's no prep, no cooking, and you can recycle the package that it comes in. Delicious meals that are good for you with over 35 options to choose from each week. Go to factormeals.com slash surf 50, less expensive than dining out, more delicious, more nutritious, factormeals.com slash surf 50. 50. Well, I've got a question for you that is, uh, will not be found on Stab Magazine or Surfline or any other surf media. And that is, what is your first memory of Kelly? Hmm. 
that's a good question. Um, I think it's the, the, um, I think it's the trestles event, but I want to say he might've been down in, in Cabo one year when I was down there for one of Herbie Fletcher's contests, like 89 or something. I think he was down there surfing in, in an event in Cabo, but really the thing is, um, you know, you didn't see too much of Kelly, uh, because it's just the way that media was back then there wasn't a lot of video drops so you caught everything in on on in the magazines and i guess so the sun deck ads like there were some sun deck ads when he was a kid and you're like oh that's the kid and everyone was talking about him you heard everyone say oh this guy wait till you see this guy and you never really saw him you know in action you saw photos of him of course but so i guess i think the i think the, the lowers event was where i saw actual surfing of him and you were like whoa might have been black and white actually I was going to say that that footage did appear in his um, his profile film, black and white. So did you see it in person or were you were you on the beach? No, no. Um, I wasn't on the beach. OK, no, I. Uh, obviously, you and I are about a decade apart in terms of age. So by the time I discovered surfing, Kelly was omnipresent, you know, um, and I was trying to think like what was my first, what was the first imagery that I saw? And I can't really remember it, but I just, he was always, he was surfing. He was the poster boy of surfing when I discovered surfing, which was a great draw for me to get into surfing, you know, because he was so uh, handsome, well-spoken, just such a good spokesperson for the sport. I remember really, this wasn't the first, but I remember seared into my brain that, uh, surfer's big issue with him in the backside barrel at glan no, not grabbing the rail you know like standing up do you remember that shot yeah he had hair back in that day yeah. um surfers of fortune the quick silver film in indonesia that was like one of my first vhs that i just spent a ton of time with and i think strider was actually on that trip as well and um the first time i saw him in person was actually the U S open where he back paddled Shane Beshin. Yeah. Good stuff. Which was a highlight moment. Um, and for anybody who doesn't remember that or hasn't seen that footage, um, it came down to a Shane Beshin and Kelly Slater final. And they were kind of, you know, for a moment there, they were rivals cause it was California boy versus Florida boy. And it was in the final and Kelly needed a score. Beshin paddled for a right wedgy right off the pier and kelly beshin had priority so he just starts digging in kelly actually paddles around shane which is just a physical feat you know like to even be able to get around shane and shane just had his head down looking at the wave because kelly was on the wrong side of him and kelly successfully paddled around him stood up on stood up and took off just enough for an interference to be called like kelly's goal was never to actually surf that wave successfully it was strictly to get the interference so it was one of the first experiences really where there was like a really tactical maneuver where it wasn't about the surfing where the surfer was really just trying to win on a technicality and so he took off behind shane and immediately kind of kicked out behind him shane had his eyes down the line pumped two or three times and then just boosted a big front side straight air and landed it and the crowd erupted. I was in like knee to waist high water, you know, just like as a 14 year old kid, just like, oh my gosh. Um, the crowd erupted and Shane thought they were erupting because he did a sick front side air. That was like one of the first really cool airs that I remember seeing in person. And, um, but they were really erupting because of the interference, you know, and Shane didn't even figure it out for quite a long time that Kelly took off behind him. And ultimately, when he did figure it out, he was pretty pissed. And yeah. Kelly went on to win that event because of it. Wow, that's that's a cool story. And that's and Paul Evans does a little bit of um, breaking down that heat a little bit. But I will say that there was a moment in the late '80s or early '90s where Damian Hardman pulled something very similar, where he literally took off in the white water after the wave had already broken. And took advantage of the rule that I think they changed, which basically said at any point during the ride, if there's somebody behind you, then they have priority. And so Damien Hardman flipped on somebody. I, I forget. It might have been Tom Carroll. It was somebody, but he flipped and took off in the white water 
stood up and gave the other surfer the interference. So yeah. uh, another tactical move that yeah probably gets lost because there wasn't a lot of footage back then of that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, congrats to Kelly. We will see him again. We'll probably see him later this year at cloud break to be perfectly honest. Well, I don't know if you watched the breakdown that he sat with Joe Trapel and Richie Lovett for about 30 minutes and um, after his heat and they talked and it was pretty much all the stuff he's already touched on. But the one thing that was interesting was the Olympics. And he was basically saying, look, I was kind of doing this year for the Olympics. If there was some way I could get in, I was going to try to do it. And he said, basically, it looks like all avenues have closed. And I've posed and posited this question with numerous people, including you. And I did so with... um Randy Rarick yesterday, but you know, basically the IOC needs to figure out a way to get Kelly Slater into the Olympics. It doesn't matter how, like, yeah, just tweak it. Like it's just good for the sport. It's just good for the Olympics. It's good. Is anybody going to complain except for the surfers? No. And do we really <laughs> care what they're com- if they're complaining then they should be more like bring, let Kelly do it. Yeah. Like, I mean, unless you're afraid. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, but it's not very sporting. What? Dude, they've got breakdancing in the Olympics this year. <laughs> sporting. I'm down. It's the I'm... spectacle. This isn't sport. Exactly. No, that's very true. Um, by the way, the commentary team in Australia has been awesome. We didn't discuss it at Bells, but the addition of, um, I do like Richie Lovett, and then the addition of uh, Vaughn Blakey, ronnie blakey's brother they're a great dynamic duo so well richie love it going down onto the stairs and talking to the coaches is incredible because mm-hmm. he's a fellow competitor he's probably beaten a few of those guys and numerous and richie love it won lowers one year yep and um so it, you can tell that they're real eye to eye there's and he knows them too you know like there's so much power in that and uh, so richie love it uh, sort of randomly on the stairs is really good too. Are you, um, did you survive survival league? I did. I barely survived. I picked John, John, and he barely got through a heat that, with, with frankly a red hot surfer. That, uh, is it Di- uh, David. David Silva? Mm-hmm. The guy's a good surfer, man. I know. I thought that's that kind first... of a bummer to see him go. He's one of the guys where you're like, really? Um, I guess I should be on tour. <laughs> Even first, though I'm not a fan, he he's kind of strikes me as everything. He's, he seems a little evil. <laughs> that, that, first, that first backside, it was a really big set wave. Backside two turn where the first turn, he really like drifted and slid the fins. I really thought that he could have got underscored on that wave. And then John John's wave was so much smaller and John ripped it. But then John's yeah. score was like, you know, half a point higher. I thought that was a really suspect exchange. Well, he had more turns. I mean, it kind of comes down to what Barton says, you know, two backside turns is all you need, apparently, you know, and that's what David Silva did. And they were crucial, mean, high speed, exceptional turns. And so were John Johns, by the way, they just weren't backside. So they didn't have that super vertical vibe to them, but they were more like release the fins. That little quick snap thing that John John does up high in the pocket that just, releases his fins a little bit re-engages it's so quick and nobody there's a few guys kelly by the way there's a few guys that can do that turn really good but he john john did more turns john john the last little bank you know quick bank section where margaret river can eat you up if you're not at high speed right there the way that the thing all comes together um i I thought it was good scoring i didn't have a problem with the scoring i didn't either i thought the judges got it right but it was um it was close for sure. And that was one of the instances where Richie Lovett was interviewing Ross Williams, you know, in those final dying minutes. Yeah. So interviewing John John's coach in real time, in the heat of the moment. And uh, John John, of course, delivered and ended up winning that heat. My survival pick was Gabriel Medina, which I stated to you last week while we were in El Salvador. There's no chance Gabriel Medina does not make the cut and he will power through this event as far as needed, even if it means winning the event. And so Gabe is kind of, we are in the round of 16 now. It hasn't started yet, but he made it through the round of 30, 32. So here's where we're at. Ideally they run the round of 16 and, um, and even the quarterfinals for the women today, like this afternoon, California time, it'll be four feet. It's not going to be great surf, but they need to get it out of the way. Because Sunday, the 21st, which would be Saturday here, 
it's going to be pumping eight to 12 feet. So if they can get it down to quarterfinals, men, semifinals, women for Sunday, their time, Saturday, our time, it's going to be an epic finals day. They just kind of got to get some heats out of the way. And I hope that they do that today. Cool. Um, regarding um, Miguel or regarding Miguel Medina, Richardson. regarding oh, okay. Medina and the cut, um, I'm not sure where they at. They <clears throat> Stab did a pretty good job of breaking it down here. And let me see if I can help well, a little bit. Last yeah, year, last year, I think the cut line was 9,300 points, 9,300 points. And Gabriel Medina is already in the 10,000 range before this event. So Gabriel Medina, um, you know, the, the math could change this year, but uh, ultimately- No, they've, they've got it. So he's already through. Okay, cool. According to Stab's breakdown, um, guaranteed spots on tour yesterday were Ryan, the last, last time they ran, Ryan Callahan, Connor O'Leary, Gabe Medina, Matthew McGivory, Jordy Smith, Leon, Leonardo, Fioravanti, Ima Kalani DeVault, Ilo Ferreira, Ramsey Bokheim, and Rio Wada. Those guys are in. Good. Yeah, Rio. Really Five male Wait. surfers fighting for their lives are Seth Moniz, Iago Dora, Miguel Pupo, Sam Pupo, and Kyle Belly. So interestingly, Miguel and Sammy Pupo are brothers, and they're in a heat <clears throat> against one another, and whoever wins makes it onto her. Whoever loses doesn't. So that's pretty cutthroat. It is. That'll be a very interesting heat, actually. I think Sammy's better positioned in this. Well, think uh, about it, though. Think about it, because one's regular foot, one's goofy foot. Yeah. It's going to be those small rights at main break. Miguel Pupo is going to have a more vertical attack. And when he's on his game, which is more often than not, he's mind blowing. Sammy's going to have to figure out a way to get more, you know, to get vertical to impress the judges on his front side, which seems more difficult on the right at main break. So I would say that the plus um, he's Miguel's got more experience, if that means anything at this point. I'm willing to take that bet. Gentleman's bet. Really? I got Sammy. You got Maggie. Okay. What are we betting for here? What's there's got to be something on the line. This just can't be a gentleman's bet. You pick the stakes. I always lose our bets, but you pick the <laughs> stakes. And I'm comfortable with Sammy. I think Sammy's just shredding. So and I like him in small rights. All right. Let's do a a ten dollar Venmo. Okay. Bet. I'm down. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Couple bucks or a couple of cups of coffee I'm down yeah. for that. All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully we find out later today. Um, in other big news, do you first of all do you want to take a bathroom break before we get into other big news? Yeah. All right. I go do. for it. We'll go to some advertisements. Rocketmoney.com slash surf. Just this week, my wife figured out she was paying a subscription for Showtime, but then also paying for Paramount Plus, which includes Showtime for free. That's precisely what Rocket Money was designed for. A modern tool that meticulously tracks the details that we easily get distracted from. It's a finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your monthly spending, and helps you lower your bills. It gives you freedom by helping you see your subscriptions in a simple dashboard and alerts you about hidden fees or increases. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash surf. Calm the clutter in your head, simplify the tedium of your financial life, and find freedom through rocketmoney.com slash surf. All right, welcome back. The other big news this week, a couple of sponsor shakeups. Rip Curl has officially signed on to sponsor the Eddie I. Cow Big Wave Invitational at Waimea Bay. Wow, that's a super good move. Good for them. I think that's super smart. I know. No brainer, right? I bet it was probably relatively inexpensive. And the amount of North Shore mojo that you receive the amount of legitimacy and the amount of marketing that you get for li very little output meaning the event incredible. doesn't meaning the event doesn't run every year but you get all the branding every year exactly exactly yeah. 
So I, I think this, yeah, obviously it is what you said, but beyond that, I think Rip Curl has made some of the most baller moves since the pandemic um, in terms of buying up marketing properties that they probably got for pennies on the dollar. You know, they swooped up three events um, on the WSL side of things as all of the other brands were dropping off as sponsors of the WSL events. Rip Curl came in and cleaned up and they took finals day. And now they essentially are synonymous with professional competitive surfing. And for them to kind of roll that into the Yeti event is just an absolute no brainer. And also because of what you said, it's got such regional spe specificity. Like you do get global uh, awareness from the event because everybody around the world is watching the event, but it really has a lot of goodwill established in that deal in that geographic area of the North shore. So I would expect rip curl to be, uh, ensuring that their retail relationships are fully stocked and well-established in retail stores throughout the, you know, Hawaii, and then being able to, um, benefit from their relationship with the ICAL family and with that event. Yeah, super. You're right. The Rip Curl's just done a great job of all of their maneuverings. Um, I can't think of anything, you know, that's where you're like Rip Curl's just core. I mean, even though they've gone public, um, they're still for whatever reason about as core as it gets probably because their, their management team is salty. You know, I think they still have a lot of salt in the building. I, I don't think you can be an Australian surf brand and not have salt in the building. I mean, the, the most CEO of CEO guys has been surfing since they were four years old. Cause you live in Australia, everybody surfs no mm -hmm. matter what, you know, like there's no, guy from Nebraska that just got the job as the new CEO of the WSL or whatever, you know, Oklahoma. But speaking of which, maybe that's a lead that we semi buried because of this later news, but the WSL has hired a new CEO. What are your thoughts? Tell us who he is, David. And um, what are your, in what's your insight there? Um, I don't really have any insights. I don't know his name. <laughs> this story was almost <laughs> a non-story to me because when I read uh, who he was and what it was. I'm like, this is totally inconsequential. Um, he's, you know, his track record or his resume, I should say, isn't what I would want it to be for somebody who is the w WSL CEO. Like it, he's just kind of gone from one job to the next two years is the max that he's ever worked anywhere. And um, what I want for the WSL is for somebody to come in who fully understands the space and the sport. And then, has a very pointed vision in how to course correct. And mm -hmm. that is not who they hired. That is not what his resume. Indicated. I don't think you know that yet. I don't think you know what his, what his vision is. So you can't make that. How I do you know like, what his vision? You don't even know his I name. I don't even know his wager. name. Dude. I feel another <laughs> wager coming. How much do you want to bet on this one? Yeah, let's bet. So, but wait, <laughs> first let's bet. I'll give you, I'll give you a chance here. Is his name Jeffrey? Is his name Ryan or is his name William? I'm going with option B. That's correct. Good thing I didn't good thing we didn't have a bet on that. Um, here's something I want you to take note of, first of all. Okay. The cut, mid-year cut this year, it's the first year that you haven't heard anybody complaining about it. You haven't heard one peep out of the competitors this year about, oh, the cut, it's unfair. I think it's partly due to is there was nobody to complain to. There was no CEO. There was no like figurehead, you know, which made me think maybe the WSL just waited until the mid-year cut to make this announcement. But that's neither here nor there. That's a little conspiracy theory. This guy's name is Ryan Crosby. He's um, comes from the Riot Games, which is a huge uh, entertainment platform in the e-space, the electronic gaming industry, which is massive, especially in... Well, for sure in Asia, but I bet in other parts of the world too. Probably here in the U.S., we just don't know about it. But the Riot Games, at the Riot Games, Ryan Crosby led global product management, marketing, and community teams. So he was involved in the sport of e-games. Prior to that, he held positions managing and building Call of Duty, Hulu, Xbox, and at Netflix demonstrating his ability to drive creativity and fan engagement. So you do not know what his vision is, but you're already poo-pooing him. Do you even know, Does is he a surfer? Yes or no? Um, no, I'm going to say no. 
he is a surfer. Where does he define, live? Define Where surfer. He, he owns a surfboard and he, I mean, you define surfer since you're the one who says no. What, uh, what, is, what does it take to be a surfer? Minimum. That, that's a great question. It really um, is. It's a tough one. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, but I would say. Owns a surfboard is definitely yeah, one of them. I would just look again. I'm guessing I, he's been surfing before and he owns a surfboard. Yeah. So he's that's a surfer. You're going to say he's a surfer. That's not the definition. I can't what come is up it? with the definition now. What is it like pornography? You know it when you see it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but look, I, where does he live, by the way? I would, if I had two okay. guesses of where he lived, I would go okay, to Connecticut yeah. or uh -huh. Manhattan Beach, California. <laughs> You're pretty close. He lives in Mar Vista, which I think is like Venice adjacent. Isn't it, it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he lives in Mar Vista, which is kind of like West Santa Monica, right? Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Which is almost, is that more hip than Manhattan Beach? I really don't know the space that well. Yeah. I'd it seems a little more urban-y, a little grittier, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, it's more hip, less affluent than Manhattan Beach. Um, so look, he lives in Mar Vista. Look, I'm not what I'm what I'm telling you or what I'm saying. Uh, he owns a surfboard, so we got he he could. We're just still trying to determine if he's a surfer or not. What else do you know about him? Nothing. That's it. Okay, I'm going to give you one more little bit of insight. You tell me if he's a surfer. He's. I think he's the president, but I know he's on the board at the surf rider foundation mm. those three mm. things if i if i didn't tell you he was the new wsl ceo and i said hey there's this guy ryan he's great he owns a surfboard he lives near the beach in southern california and he's the president of the surf rider foundation would you say he's a surfer yes or no he's not the president of the surf rider foundation no no he's the president of the board okay like but he's on the board i know he's on the board i'm not sure exactly that shows that shows that he had look it has the word surf in it that doesn't mean all surfer everybody involved I, in surf rider foundation is a surfer it just means that you but have if you own a environmental but if you own a surfboard and you're well, on the board of the surf rider foundation and you live in southern california on the beach you're still not convinced this whoever this person is isn't a surfer mar vista is not on the beach and I mean, uh, come on, it's in Southern California. I mean, he's what is he, 10 minutes from Malibu or something? He's, he's 10 he's minutes from Malibu. No, look, I'm not convinced. Um, the reality is, any anything that I all of my assessments that I made were not based on him as an individual. I've never met the guy, I don't know who he is. Clearly, yeah. my it, assessments are based on what Dirk Ziff's motive and missive is from the top, and it is not to employ somebody who has autonomy and a vision and wants to redirect the ship. Dirk Ziff's purpose point is to put somebody in as a um, a figurehead just to operate, just to represent. They need a CEO in place if they're going to sell the business. And their objective is to sell the business at this point. Their really? objective, yeah, their objective was to build fan engagement and viewership so that the sale would be more lucrative. Is this insight that you've gleaned from somebody or did i miss the boat on does everyone know this is this like common knowledge that they're trying to sell the wsl yes this is i don't know how common it is but yes this has been insights gleaned from the last five years of various people working in the organization and yes telling tidbits along the way because i thought like like i want to say a year ago or something you were like look dirk just wants to hang on to this as a tax write-off it's just like the perfect loss well, leader that that all was speculation because we what else would you be doing with it? You know right. what I mean? But um, but yeah, I mean, as much as four years ago, I knew of meetings that were taking place with them trying to offload the asset. So, um, but, you know, Elo in his role was to just be, um, to not enact change, but simply to- Wall of silent noise, wall of positive noise. He, he kind of propped up the wall. Correct. Entirely. That was one part of it was to uh, accept our, you know, receive our feedback, the negative feedback from the community and just put a positive spin on it. But the other thing was to use a megaphone to uh, pr promote Dirk's ideologies and objectives. So that's what he doesn't want a CEO is going to come in and actually try to make a better quality product. They're not convinced you know, that, that's not their objective at all. Right. And so I don't think at this point they're going to bring somebody in who's going to try to clean 
redirect the ship. Ultimately, the Olympics is coming. That's going to be a huge boon for interest in surfing. And if they are trying to offload the asset, they want to kind of, they're betting on that being something that really drives engagement, drives viewership, boosts all the numbers so they can kind of base the sale on those numbers. And you can't do that with a vacant chair in the CEO position. So they need a CEO. They need an interim CEO who's going to come in and be a placeholder. And the reality is, look, if you are a CEO who is coming from running, let's say, Hulu or any whatever giant corporation, a CEO who is worth their weight, who's proven themselves, mm -hmm. they would not take this job. This job. Well, he wasn't a CEO there. He was. That's my point. That's right. my point. If there is a super qualified CEO and they're looking to advance their place in, in their career trajectory and their place in life, yeah. they would not take this position right. unless there was huge, huge, huge financial upside. So ultimately they found somebody who this was going to be an upgraded position for and would be willing to take that gamble and have potentially a stain on their resume as the ship is going down and losing money year after year. You know what I mean? Yeah, so but I look at it. What about this? Um, what about if, if, you're like, hey, this seems like I just did an interview with Dirk. He's basically saying we're going to be selling this product. Wouldn't it be great to be the CEO that's there at, to to see the sale through? That's like a good resume builder. Like if you're the guy that took the and and helped sell the business to another company, that's a good move. Like if that so happens, I'm suggesting great. I'm suggesting to you that that a CEO would be like, cool, that actually looks good. I'm going to take it and help them move this product on to whoever the buyer is. And that seems like a positive, at least a flat line move, if not an up move on your career. Depends what your career is, um, because that would be a down move for Jeff Bezos. You know what well, I mean? Of but course. It would be, I mean, geez, well, the I'm, United States is a down move for Jeff Bezos. Exactly. I mean, well, my, But my point is, for some people, that would be a good move. For others, it might not be. But it's well, a gamble because it might not ever come to fruition and you could just be on a sinking ship as part of your resume. So I would... You know, if I was offered that job, you would have to assess kind of what the what the risk level is and what the compensation is essentially. And right. so Ryan, who they got, it seems to be worth that gamble for him because it's a CEO position. You know, the affiliation with Dirk is probably a positive thing as well. But I would not be convinced that they are going to be able to execute the sale at a number that is really meaningful. You know, I think the the kind of hedge on the wave pool thing like hey let's sell this to the middle east they got one pool built in the middle east there's probably a bunch of people in the middle east who would put one of these in their backyard um and so <laughs> maybe you could find somebody there who would throw money at this a la yeah. the live tour from golf and that model and that could be a potential sale but there's not a lot of i can't think of a lot of potential buyers who would take over this distressed asset for a meaningful number. Well, it's an interesting th um, asset in that, like, what are you buying? Like, if you're like, okay, I'm interested in what are you, what are you buying? And if you say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm selling a league, you know, that has these athletes. And I would say, well, how am I guaranteed that these athletes are going to come with the sale? Yeah. You know, well, that's all they got. That's all these, first of all, they're 20 years old and their dream is to travel the world and surf. And this is their only, basically, this is their only option for that from a competitive standpoint. They've These young kids have risen through the ranks in the NSSAs and all these amateur organizations, and they've gotten to this place where they're launching into their pro career, and we're it. Like, we've got the labor force, and they're hungry, and they're inexpensive because this is the only option for them. That was all true up until five years ago, and the WSL did such a poor job managing that exact detail that those people went and found careers elsewhere. So Nathan Florence being the prime example, went and found a career elsewhere. He doesn't need them. And even yeah, their but he, own- No, wait, wait. Nathan Florence wasn't a WSL competitor. I know, but even their own athletes now don't need them. Like Gabriel Medina can go and have a meaningful career without the WSL. Ultimately, what the WSL has done is Caleb Robson and- Liam O'Brien are the athletes that they will be able to transition to the new owner and be like, look, these guys have nowhere else to go, but those aren't the marquee guys anymore. The marquee guys and girls have proven they don't need the WSL. So all of that that you said was true. They had nowhere else to go up until they starched all of the interest from their core viewership.
Okay, so the number one guy, one of the number one guys I would suggest to you is Griffin Colapinto. One, because like Felipe and Gabe and Steph and all these others that you mentioned, they he hasn't won a world title yet. So what the WSL does is they go, hey, we're the platform for you to become a world champion, just like Kelly Slater. And so Griff is, the, in my opinion, a great example of a guy I would ask you, if they sold, Griff could go and and market himself in a different way and kill it and doesn't need the WSL and and will never have a world title. Yeah. Then why isn't he doing that? Why isn't he already doing that? His whole drive since he was a Grom was winning heats. You know what I mean? Like that's encoded in his DNA to right. be to prove himself in that format. So I think he So he will go, he would go he would go to the next iteration of professional championship surfing. I think yeah, it's And he's the number one guy. Him. He's the, he's the guy. Without Felipe on tour, yeah. Well, Felipe's already won titles. I'm my feeling is and I'm kind of going with what you're saying like the guys that still haven't reached that pinnacle of what their their goal has been since they were 12. Yeah. Those guys, there's quite a few of those guys that are marketable. Like I, I would suggest to you that Griffin Cole Pinto is a very marketable asset. Yeah, he's on the top of the heap for sure. And they'd be wise to double down on branding him as their guy. I mean, they they could do it regionally because Ethan Ewing would be right there with him. You Kanoa. Know? Kanoa could be a regional asset too. Well, maybe one of the poopers. There's quite a few Brazilians that I think are Yago Dora. Yep. They, so I think you have, I think you would have labor assets that are worthy in the sale of this thing. Yeah. And they would all stay. And you and I, both of us, the fans would watch. Like, wouldn't you watch Griffin versus Ethan Ewing? I mean, I'm not watching them at Bells or Margaret River. So they have to rework what we've been talking well, about for yeah. years, which is just put them in good waves and then I'll watch. Yeah. But yeah. Well, um <laughs> I'm just trying to get you to <laughs> You're still you're still bearish on the WSL now that Ryan Crosby's been hired. You're like same old, same old. It's totally and the same I understand old. he's where a placeholder. He's a placeholder. Look, look, I love somebody was somebody commented, I think DM'd me last night on Instagram joking about how they didn't remember that Gabriel Medina won Margaret's last year either. And I said, when Scott and I first started doing this podcast, I can name who won every event for the last decade. And it wasn't not only events, I could tell you what heat. You knew Challenger wearing. series, guys. You're like, exactly. Yeah, I've, been, I've been following Tanner Godowska since he was 10. <laughs> exactly. And their heat scores, you know what I mean? And, you know, but maybe, isn't that a reflection on you? Because you and I be. both know you've changed, you know, things have changed in your life. You got married, you have a child. Very well could be. Things are and changing. It be, and it could be my memory isn't as good either, right? However, a lot of listeners also did not remember that Gabriel Medina won Margaret River last year. There was a, I think it's the Mandela effect, right? Of how do we not know Gabriel won last year, the Margaret River event? And it was because all of our interest has waned in the WSL. Like we're paying attention. I used to do these heat recap or these uh, event contest recaps at the end of an event. It would be like an episode where, where it was just kind of detailed, um, yeah. You know, breakdown. my re my review breakdown of the event. Yeah. And I would try to keep them to five minutes, but sometimes they would go 15 minutes. And when we were in El Salvador, one of our listeners commented, he's like, dude, those recaps were so great because it, I didn't have to watch the event. He would give me the <laughs> recap. You give me a three day recap in 15 minutes. And it was very detailed and kind of in it was the highlights of what went down, whether it was an interference or whatever. And I go, yeah, I liked doing them until like after there was like six events in a row that just felt like a burden, like a, like it was real tedious trying to write them and come up with the enthusiasm and the interest to write, record, publish those episodes. And after six, I realized, oh, these events are boring. And then a year went by without doing them and I didn't miss it. And then two years went by and I didn't miss it. And now we're four or five years down the road beyond that, you know, to where we don't even remember who won this event well, last year. I'm going to reiterate something that you and I've talked about in the past, which is when you look at like, say, tennis championships, and there's four majors, right? The Australian US Open, Wimbledon, and um, one other one that I can't remember. And those, the French Open. And so those four, like, I'm not going to watch 
opening rounds of those events. These are the big ones, but I love it when it's time for the quarters, the semis and the finals. Like I'm going to watch quote unquote finals day and the same with golf and probably the same with some other sports that are individual sports. Like you've got to be diehard geek guy to watch the opening round of the French open. Like nobody yeah. really does that, but we watch yeah. on Saturday morning or Sunday night or whatever it is when it's on. And I think that that's sort of the model that the WSL should be leaning towards, which is like, they have a perfect setup for that. Now finals day at Margaret could be eight to 12 feet with all the greatest guys that we want to see surfing and a lot of drama all in one day. You and I only have to spend one day. And yeah. I think that the, if they drove towards that instead of opening, Oh, the first swell of the, of the waiting periods here, they need to sort of try to consider mother nature, of course, being what she is driving towards great surf at the very end of the event, which is really what we only have time for now. That, yeah. That would be certainly a step in the right direction because even I'm not even watching finals day at the bells event this year, yeah. you know, and, or the Portugal event. And I was, as stated previously, the most core fan possible, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think okay. a, another thing, like we, we've kind of belabored the point. Um, so I'll save my other point for a future show. Ryan Crosby, yay or nay? I'm sure he's a super nice guy. I'm sure this is a great opportunity for him. I have zero uh, optimism that he is going to return our culture to its rightful owners. Okay. Good, good answer. Fair enough. And uh, we, we shall see. We shall see. Right. Let's well, just. Well, well, the other huge news this week oh. is, is that Tyler Wright just signed a deal with our beloved sponsor, drinkag1.com slash surf, believe it or not. I had no idea. Things are turning for the better for Tyler. She just barely, she made the cut too. I know, just barely. Um, she's got a big heat with Katie Simmers coming up hopefully today. Uh, but look, we love drinkag1.com slash surf. I am actually pinning and attributing my lack of um, lowered GI issues in El Salvador <laughs> to my drinkag1.com slash surf. I was pounding that stuff every morning and I was one of 50% in our group who never experienced any issues. Yeah. And when I did have issues, I asked you for some AG1 because I know right. that there's some probiotics in there that I needed. And um, I'm a big fan of everything AG1. I've, I'm I'm taking off on a trip in a little while and I'm re-upping my um, yoga routine. And part of my yoga routine is AG1 before I go into the rooms. So yeah. Good. Yeah. I was, people brought Imodium, people brought Pepto-Bismol as preventatives. And I was like, I didn't bring any of that stuff. All I did was drink ag1.com slash surf. Uh, and I was perfectly fine. So I'm a big fan and congrats to Tyler Wright. I'm presuming now she's going to win a world title after this relationship. Oh, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I, you're right about Katie Simmers matchup is going to be exciting. I mean, that feels like a final. Totally. Yeah. Um, well, you already mentioned your must see moment was the article that Paul Evans wrote for stabmag.com about Kelly Slater. Mine is actually something that I saw years ago. We may have even discussed it here as a must-see moment, but it's been making the rounds on Instagram again. I've had like five people send it to me this week. And it's just a short three-minute little film on Instagram about a 92-year-old New Zealand surfer named Nancy Maherney. And do you remember this video? Old yeah. lady surfer? Yeah. It's, it's really cool. Um, it's just a sweet little profile video of this, you know, old woman. Um who loves to surf and her version of surfing is uh, catching white water on a bodyboard. It's just a scrap of foam. Actually, it's not laminated or anything. It's not even a real bodyboard. It looks like EPS styrofoam, uh, but it's like chunks are missing from it and everything, but it floats her. And um, it's, it's just really charming and sweet. She talks about, I think they're probably interviewing her about how she's lived to the age of 92 and still lives kind of a vibrant life. And among her lessons were avoid sugar. She said sugar puts people in the hospital. She grows her own vegetables. She rides her bike every day. 
she dances. And so it shows her just dancing in the living room. She just has music on and she's just dancing. When was the last time you danced? At a wedding, probably. But I mean, like you were, that was a forced dance. When was the last time you joyously moved your body to the rhythms of the music, not caring in the, anybody sees you or any, anybody judges you for how you're doing it? Only at a wedding, actually, or with Austin. Austin will bust, bust out some dance moves, so we will dance with him, but not on You're at a own. wedding dancing, you're doing it with a joyous lack of judgment, with your eyes closed, moving to the rhythms of the music and not without a care in the world? Yeah. Good for you, brother. The ayahuasca is working for you, too. I have not gone on that journey myself, but um, but yeah, I have embraced wedding dancing. Um, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, that's a very interesting sentence. No, because you're right. I mean, you, you bring up a great point is that there was a lot of, uh, self awareness or, you know, inhibition, uh, pr for a lot of years in terms of dancing in public environments, but no, I've given that up in recent years and embraced it and I'm having the best time of my life. Uh, but Nancy just dance in free form in the living room is part of her success, you know, into living a long, happy, healthy life. And then the other thing, which is the focal point of the video is she catches waves. She still goes surfing as often as she possibly can. So I will post this video clip. I forget who produced it, but, uh, New Zealand, 92 year old Nancy Malhern's video catching. I love water. this. It's I so cute. This. I yeah, love her. Nice. I love her whole thing. No sugar dance, catch waves, eat vegetables. Yeah, that's kind of very, it's so simple and it's like incredibly truthful. Totally. So um, that was my musty moment presented by Trees Wax, which is, of course, petroleum free surf wax. I'm going to tie this in with another thought that I had related to a recap of El Salvador and Kelly Slater's retirement. It is a theme. And that is <laughs> Volcom is doing a collaborative um, line of clothing with Peter Schroff, Schroff times Volcom or ex Volcom. And they go and they they do a little profile video with him, six minutes long. It's on YouTube. And as they're entering Schroff's workspace, there's this placard above that says, it's never enough. And Schroff stops and talks to the camera and addresses it. And he goes, it's human nature. You know, it's never enough. Like you get something and you just want more of it. And so that's, you know, I just acknowledge that basically in my work. And I was thinking about Kelly and I was like, the guy can't quit. Like he's being forced off tour, and he's like, yeah, but wait, I'm going to get a wild card. I'm going to come back. I'm going to get Griffin back. It's like, dude, Griffin wasn't even alive when you were winning world titles. Like, let it go. It's okay. Walk away. It's enough. Like you've done it all. Focus on your kid. Just relinquish this. You don't need, you know, you, you can't ultimately like, you can't feel happiness if you were just if you can't be satisfied with 11 world title and 56 wins or whatever it is, you will never be satisfied. It's okay to move on was my thought. And there was a surfer on our trip in El Salvador named Sam. Sam brought his family. And Sam is an actualized human being. He is living the dream. He does not surf very often anymore. He's been living in the San Juan Islands off the coast of Seattle where there's not easy access to surf. And when he does surf, he's wearing five millimeter wetsuits. And so he has not been surfing in some time prior to this trip. And even when he did, it was infrequently and it was in a wetsuit. Well, Sam paddled out with us at the point break and it was crowded and it was head high. And he sat on the inside, took off on a sketchy, fast wave right along the cobblestones and goofy footer. So again, hasn't surfed for a long time, but took off on a critical wave backside, surfed it flawlessly along the rocks. The thing's like running along the cobbles and it's kind of sketchy. Surfs it flawlessly, kicks out, looks at some of the people in our group and goes, I got my one. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> and he bails. I was so there for that. You and I were right next to each other. And that was so cool. Has not surfed in a long time surfed away flawlessly, like again, to his ability level, did what he meant to do and checked out because for Sam, it is enough. You know what I mean? Like Sam knows this is what I came to do. I did it. I don't need any more. And he went in. And 
one of the nights, I think it might've been after you left, he um, addressed everybody at dinner. Everybody was sitting around and he kind of got everybody's attention. He was just like, Hey, I just want to say, um, this has been such an awesome trip for me. Uh, he had some health issues that he disclosed and I'm just grateful to be here, grateful to make all these friendships and grateful to be able to surf in warm water and have this experience with my family. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I just thought to myself, Sam has it figured out because you know how I'm feeling. I've surfed for six days, got plenty of waves and I, I'm not happy because tomorrow I want to go out and I want to get a set wave. And if I don't surf that set wave to my fullest potential, I'm going to feel like I didn't quite do it right. You know what I mean? Whereas I should just be resting on the fact that I've harvested my count. Like I am satiated. By the way, I saw you get many set waves and surf them flawlessly. So you and I should have been happy with that. You You did it. Exactly. Like I'm done. I could just check out now. I could just relax at this point and rest on my laurels. But there's something in me driven by ego that Kelly Slater knows about, that Peter Schroff knows about, which is just like, I want more. And you know what? I had three that session and that felt great. But when I decided to go in, I looked over my shoulder and I saw somebody getting one and it made me want to paddle back out and get more of it. And now I'm going in because I'm tired, but I'm pissed because I'm not getting more. But you know what I mean? Like it is enough. You're okay. You got the three, just accept it and go in and live happily knowing that you got those three like Sam did. Yeah. You know, I, I there's a, there's sort of a, a maxim, uh, you know, in this, uh, in the space of serenity, which is let go or be dragged. And I think that's relevant in, in what you're saying here. So Slater's, you know, iconic film that you reference all the time, Letting Go, is sequel to that. Because <laughs> I've be been dragged. Get, getting dragged. <laughs> and it could be all of his heats from the last five years other than Pipeline. That would be so funny if somebody put a mashup of that. I love J.P. Curry's headline for his recap of the event from that day at Margaret's, which was Kelly's greeted by his pallbearers on the sand, you know? And it was like, Kelly being chaired up the beach isn't, I mean, it was, it was kind of displayed on the internet as congratulations, but under a different lens, it is his pallbearers, you know, it's them chairing him up after he got beat out of competition. Yeah. So letting go or getting dragged. Kelly got dragged up the beach, essentially. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I I'm all for uh Kelly. I guess at this point it's like Kelly 6.0 or Kelly 7.0, but it's him in the commentary booth for the quarterfinals or just the semifinals and the finals of each and every event for the next little while. I'm I'm fine with that. I would like that. I, I just as a fan, I would love listening to it. But I would also be okay with adding on a wild card at Fiji, yeah. and then him like smoking fools in that event because it's ten foot. You know. Yeah. By the way, he wouldn't it be neat if the, somebody at NBC reached out to him and he was involved in the commentary booth at the Olympics. I think that's a no brainer too. I'm sure um, Terry Harding's already on that. Yeah. Yeah. Terry Hardy. Okay. Well, look, David, we've said a lot. We've, we've got a lot going on here. There's, it's been a uh, robust and full and deep show. Passionate. Yes. Until next time, adios and aloha. Hey Bass, Real Water Sports. They're doing a site-wide sale right now, back to shred. They do a couple times a year, but they also just got a drop of those Channel Islands board bags that we love so much. Yeah, you know what? The Channel Islands has come out with a new board bag. Uh, you and I have them. We're excited about them. And um, Real Water Sports, back to froth. Is that what they call it? Back to shred. Back to shred. Realwatersports.com. So, I think their back to shred stuff is probably, don't quote me on this, but it's probably like, um, you know, last season's gear and the Channel Island stuff probably doesn't qualify for the discount, but look, you can grab a bunch of stuff on discount. And then if you want the new Channel Island stuff, that's the place to get it. I love the board bags, but also the Snuggie, like the single board sock 
is the best Snuggie that I've ever experienced. It's a 2.0 version for them. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. The material, Snuggie. the material's epic, but then it has the rail, uh, the padded rail kind of things along the side of the Snuggie. So it's form fitted and that just adds the extra, extra protection for the rails yeah. and your boards. Yeah. So uh, Real Water Sports has the whole line of the new Channel Islands accessories, bags, products, backpacks, all that kind of stuff. So if you've heard us talk about it, or if you saw it on Instagram on our El Salvador trip and you want some realwatersports.com is an opportunity to get it. Realwatersports.com, our friends trip and his crew over there. Um, wonderful customer service and uh, just a great place to get your gear. Go check it out. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay, bud. talk to you soon. See you later.